Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Hola and welcome everyone. It's so good to be with you today celebrating faith and family and friendship as we worship God, follow Jesus, serve others, and make disciples. Uh, there is a lot this week. There is so much in these stories that, that Scripture has given us. And, and that, to be honest, there are some times where I'm sitting back there listening because I've read the, 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 the Scripture for the week so many times. And then somebody will say something from the, from the pulpit, from the ambo, and say something in a way that I had never read it that way before. And I'm like, ah, I should have preached on that. That did not happen when Chris was reading today. <laughs> but I am so thankful that you did, Chris. I really am. I, I, it, it's so enriching um, to hear it. So uh, today's liturgy and lessons are treasures to behold for sure. Um, they show the power of how Christ can turn terminators into transformers. And I'm, I'm using some dated pop culture references here. So, so let me explain. When I was growing up, the rage among all the five to 10 year olds were these little plastic toys known as transformers. And we had some really bad cartoons that accompanied them. <laughs> and these ingenious little gizmos look like the average like robot, like alien kind of creature thing. But with a, uh, a, a tutored pull and twist and click and flip, all these small fingers could transform a, a car or a tank or an airplane into like a living robot that would, you know, have a personality and, and talk to other robots. And then they would turn into whatever it was that they turned into. They transformed into the something else. And it was really cool. Sometimes it actually took like a day to figure out how to turn that thing into a robot or turn it back into a car. But, but Transformers were enormously popular when I was growing up. Now about 20 years ago, uh, there's another thing that was wildly popular when I was growing up, back in the summer of 1991. Can you believe that's almost 20 years ago? Um, there was a release of yet another Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. And don't be surprised, all of you, I bet right now could turn to your neighbor and do your best Arnold Schwarzenegger impression. All right, because everybody has one. Don't pretend you don't, Marty. I know you do. Look at Betty. All right? So everybody turn to your neighbor and do your best Arnold Schwarzenegger impression. Ready, set, go. <laughs> Those were all great. Really. Uh, I had a long plane ride, so I was writing this. Um, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, everyone has an Arnold, you know, especially here because we have the Arnold Classic in Columbus. But um, there was this movie back in 1991 called Terminator 2, okay, Terminator 2, or T2, as it became known. And all the characters from the original Terminator movie um, of this futuristic sci-fi run-for-your-life movie were there. All, the, all of the characters were there, except there was a difference. You see, in the first Terminator movie, Arnold Schwarzenegger was um, basically a robot, a killer robot, dressed in skin. To trying to go after John Connor's mom, right? So we're trying to get after her, Sarah, and he was trying to get her. Well, he didn't. Kyle Reese got in the way. So in the second Terminator movie, we see Arnold Schwarzenegger, this big, beefy guy, and we're supposed to believe he has, you know, he's a, he's a robot underneath, and he's, he's scary looking, and he comes, and now this one in the first movie who was supposed to be after this person to kill this person now becomes, sorry, spoiler alerts, 20 years later, um, the guardian angel of the ones in the first movie he was sent to kill. Now he's the guardian angel. I see some of you get it because you're shaking your head, yes, so thank you. So these, there are other robots then that were sent from the future, I know, um, to get John Connor and his mom, Sarah Connor, but now the one who was supposed to get him originally was now their greatest protector. And of course, at the end of the first one, the Schwarzenegger droid had threatening, be, vowed, he said, I'll be back, right? At the conclusion of the first movie, and now, now he returns in the second movie as the good guy. Well, these two 
contemporary examples, illustrate what it is like for what we heard and what we read for Paul and Ananias and Simon Peter and the other disciples to experience the transforming grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. If ever there was a Terminator-like character in the Bible, it had to be Saul. He was enthusiastically on the church's greatest enemies list, top 10. I mean, accordingly, when Ananias, I mean, you can tell on the lesson today, when Ananias heard that Saul is headed to Damascus, when Saul is headed just to his town, he expects nothing than his worst nightmare and horror. I mean, it was hasta la vista, baby. <laughs> it was that kind of moment in time, for sure. Yet, both men, both Saul and Ananias, don't leave Ananias out of this, both Saul and Ananias were changed from the inside out. Saul, through his encounter with the living Christ on the road, he spends 180 degrees in his life orientation. He's just walking along. He's got the papers. He's got the arrest warrants. He's got all the authority he needs. He's got all the credentials that one could possibly have as a Jewish Pharisee to get all the followers of the way. And that's what it was. I mean, we call ourselves Christians, but back in this time, they called themselves followers of the way with a capital W. They were following not just a way. It's like the Ohio State University. It is the way. There is no other way. This is the way. Following Jesus crucified, risen. And so they were following him, and, and Saul's going to go get him. He has the authority to arrest you. He has the authority to murder you. He could kill you in the street. Nobody could do anything about it. That's the kind of venom he was able to spew. That's the kind of person that Saul was. He loved God so much in his view of God that he was willing to beat anyone else into submission who deviated from the way he thought. And so Ananias heard that Saul was coming. And honestly, he was filled with fear. And Christ comes to Saul on the road and he blinds him. Maybe that's where we get that song. Blinded by the light. Right? And so he's on the road and he's like, ah! Have you ever been that way? When you're like dead asleep and then all of a sudden someone flips on the light and you're like, ah! That was, I mean, it was a blinding light. And so Saul's there and, and Christ talks to him and goes, what are you doing? What are you doing? Stop it! And Saul says, well, who are you? I'm Jesus, who are you persecuting? And then he was blinded, and that blindness stayed. Our blindness recovers from the light. Saul's seemed to stay. And so he makes his way to Damascus, and, and Christ tells Ananias, I know that you love me. I know you're a follower. Now you're going to have to do something that you don't want to do. Ananias' fear and loathing for this persecutor coming his way was changed by Christ's words. Instead of fear, instead of venom being spewed back at Saul, Christ's words changed Ananias to openness and acceptance. And if you were reading along with Chris, you saw that whenever Saul came to be baptized by Ananias, what does Ananias do? As soon as he comes into the house, he calls him brother. He is a brother in the faith. Now let's switch gears to the gospel lesson. Simon Peter in our gospel lesson today is filled with guilt and convinced of his failure. Remember that uh, back in the courtyard on Good Friday, what did Simon Peter say? You know, when someone said, oh, you're one of Jesus' disciples, he said, I, I don't know him. And he said three times, just as Jesus had prophesied. He said it three times, I don't know him, I deny him, and then the cock crowed, and we remember Peter fell into tears, as I'm sure many of us can understand. And so, we have Simon Peter here in the boat. Now, I will be honest with you, I always find it funny when I read this passage, because what happens? They say, number one, any sailor knows, don't say, throw the net on the right side of the boat. 
every sailor knows, what do you say? The starboard side, that's the right side, right? Okay, right? Port, so, you know, anyway. So and I'm not a sailor, but I was married to one, or not married one, I was a uh, son to one. So anyway, so the, the, you have your starboard side and your port side. Now, number one, how many of you like it when someone comes into your office and says, hey, you should do it this way? <laughs> how many of you like that? How many of you like it when your spouse or maybe someone that's, that's in the house with you and you're looking at them and you're making dinner? And, oh, I wouldn't do it that way. Well, then you make dinner, you know, that kind of thing. And so, you know, here's Jesus. They don't even know who he is. And he's, number one, he calls them children. Children? <laughs> okay, so they're out on 100 yards off. And by the way, the Sea of Tiberias is also the Sea of Galilee. It's the same thing, okay? So they're in the Sea of Galilee, and, and Jesus from the shore says, hey, you're doing it wrong. You know, and these experienced fishermen are, you know, I would have been like, okay, thanks. You know, that kind of thing. But they, they follow what he's saying, whether they have to lose. Now, this is really interesting. When, when one of the disciples says, it's the Lord, what does Simon Peter do? Scripture tells us, number one, he puts on clothes to jump in the water. <laughs> what? There's so many things wrong with this in one city, right? So he, he's, number one, you're naked um, out on the Sea of Galilee. And this tan that you see right here is because I was on the top deck of a boat for four hours and I forgot about the sun's reflection off the water onto my face. So his whole body is exposed to the sun, right? But he puts on clothes to jump in the water to go to Jesus. And then something was interesting. When I was at Holden Village, we had um, this little Bible study called Bible and Brew. I won't go into it. Um, and, um, and so I went, and there were 20 of us crammed into the village pastor's uh, living room. We were talking about this. It never hit me before, but one of the people said, hey, maybe the reason he put on clothes is remember that story of original sin with Adam and Eve? What's the first thing that they did? They covered themselves. They covered themselves. And so here's Simon Peter getting ready to come up to the Lord, who he denied three times. He covers himself, then jumps in the water. He goes up to Jesus. And what is the first thing that Jesus says? Now, what's the first thing? You ever get to that point where someone has wronged you, and you're just waiting for that moment to be like, I got the perfect thing to say. And what, but Simon Peter comes up to him, and, and what, is, what does Jesus say? I mean, he, he died. He rose again. This is the third time he comes to the disciples. He's had time to think about it. And the first thing that Jesus says is a word of forgiveness. The first thing that Jesus says is a word of acceptance. The disciple who could not even stand up for his Lord on the night he was in prison is now called to, by Jesus, to feed his sheep, to watch over and guard them into the future. Part of what children find so interesting about transformers is that they transform between a person and a vehicle uh, of some kind. And it's not always easy to transform them. It, sometimes it takes some work and some twisting and remembering and forgetting. Christ's transforming love empowers us in the same way, to change from our original form into something new. We become vehicles, therefore, of Christ's love. And like Saul, we are charged with carrying Christ the good news out into the world. Christ's power of love can and does transform us. There is an essential question that all of us struggle with sometime or another, and maybe we're struggling with it right now. Can people really change? Can I really change? And the answer that we see here is yes. The answer that I've seen in my life as a person and as a pastor is yes. I've seen addicts turned clean by the power of Christ. I've seen broken relationships mended. Does it happen overnight? Sometimes, but not usually. But change can happen, especially 
if you are the change that you want to see in the world. You know, a a famous preacher once said, when people tell me that human nature cannot be changed, I am moved to reply that in light of my experience, human nature may be the only thing that can be changed. Change cannot, we can't change the course of the moon or the sun. We can't change the laws of physics in the world. We can't change the movement or flow of the ocean. We can't change the stars in the sky and their course that they move in. However, the Bible pulsates from its pages with testimonies of lives, purposes, events, habits, which have been changed and can be changed. Over and over we see in the Bible that when God changes a person, they change their name. And it's to signify a new identity that they have in God. God changed Abram's name to Abraham, which I'm not sure is kosher, but it's ham, bacon, boy, they're missing out. Anyway, um, changed Sarah's wife, or Sarah, man, I am tired. Abraham's wife, Sarah. So first it was Sarai. Sarai means princess. Sarah means mother to the nations. There are so many examples of this where God's change is real, so real that people change their names. Jacob turns to Israel, Sarai to Sarah, Simon to Peter, Saul to Paul. All of these people and so many more had their lives changed, truly changed by the true and living God. And while you and I might not change our names, our lives are changed too by the one who turned victory of darkness and evil and torture and death on a Friday to the symbol of our hope and life and new life and the symbol that we get on Sunday, where death turns to life, defeat into victory, lost into found, sinner into saint. This is all possible because something changed. And that something that changed is the fact that Jesus is not dead, for Christ is risen... He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And because he lives, real change is real. This is the good news. Thanks be to God. Amen.